Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Content Patch for the 15th of August 2014. My name is Total Biscuit with today's gaming news and comment. Coming up in the show, the mysterious case of the Square Enix non-exclusive. All this in the OC Remix track of the day is coming your way right about now. There were quite a few angry people on August the 12th when the Microsoft press conference went live at Gamescom 2014. Alongside the usual announcements about 50 minutes into the show, Rise of the Tomb Raider, the sequel to Square Enix's 2013 Tomb Raider title, made an appearance on the main stage along with the announcement that it would be coming holiday 2015 exclusively on Xbox. This was punctuated again on stage claiming that this was a game coming exclusively to Xbox. Of course, this upset a great deal of people. The original Tomb Raider 2013 was released on several platforms, with a so-called definitive version being released on both the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4. Of course, those of us who bought it on PC already owned the definitive version of the game to begin with, but it was a multi-platform release. So the announcement that supposedly the sequel to this title would be an Xbox exclusive annoyed a great deal of people. Alongside this announcement came the skepticism surrounding it, the idea that Square Enix had been extremely vocal about Tomb Raider not selling enough copies, despite the fact that by the 9th of June 2014, the game had shifted over 6.5 million units, with over 1 million copies sold within the first 48 hours of release. It was, I think by anyone's definition, an obvious success. After Square Enix's complaints, it seemed a little odd, to say the least, that they would deliberately limit the number of copies they could sell by releasing it on the least popular next generation platform. However, it would seem that Microsoft has eventually decided to come clean as opposed to deliberately misleading people, as Phil Spencer confirmed that the agreement with Square Enix has a duration, meaning that this is actually a timed exclusive, and once the agreement expires, Square Enix are free to do whatever they want with Rise of the Tomb Raider. So what? it's actually a timed exclusive. Phil Spencer claimed that he wasn't trying to fake anybody out in terms of where this thing is. However, I think it's blindingly obvious that that's exactly what they were doing. This announcement of Rise of the Tomb Raider as exclusively on Xbox is, quite frankly, a lie by omission. And not only that, but the developer Crystal Dynamics engaged in exactly the same behavior. In a post to Tumblr of all places, they addressed the Tomb Raider community and claimed that they would give some insight into the decision and why they feel it's the, quote, very best thing for the Tomb Raider sequel were creating at the studio. They went on to deliver platitudes such as the success of Tomb Raider 2013 was in large part to your continued support and then claimed that quote our friends at Microsoft have always seen huge potential in Tomb Raider and we know they will get behind this game more than any support we have had from them in the past and we believe this will be a step to really forging the Tomb Raider brand as one of the biggest in gaming with the help, belief and backing of a major partner like Microsoft. So really that doesn't actually explain anything other than Microsoft are giving us a sack of money. Now, the post went on to be even more flippant, saying that, oh, don't worry, we're not walking away from fans that only play on PlayStation or on PC. Those are great systems with great partners and amazing communities. We have Tomb Raider and the Temple of Osiris coming to those platforms. For those that don't know, Temple of Osiris is something of a successor to Lara Croft and the Guardian of Light, which was actually a pretty good game, but it was also an isometric sort of Xbox Live style arcade game. It was good, I mean, it was better than like the last four or five Tomb Raider titles before that, but it's certainly not the same game, and this time around it seems to be more of an action-focused co-op title with the same sort of isometric viewpoint. Not exactly a good substitute to a full-on AAA third-person Tomb Raider game, especially considering the quality of Tomb Raider in 2013 and the almost universal acclaim that it received. So let's talk about that and let's talk about exclusives, shall we? There's a big difference between a timed exclusive and a regular exclusive. A regular exclusive probably never coming to another platform. Usually these exclusives are created by first party developers, as in developers that are heavily affiliated with or directly owned by Sony, Microsoft or Nintendo. A lot of these games are done in-house and they're usually done as showpieces for the machine itself. And there are others which are simply publishing agreements, like say Nintendo with platform 
Platinum Games Bayonetta 2 and why that is a Wii U exclusive. Now, there are several benefits to actually creating an exclusive title, so before I go on to why I hate exclusive titles, let's look at the possible benefits there. Bayonetta 2 is a pretty good example. This is a title that didn't sell incredibly well, although I would say it did reasonably, as most of Platinum games tend to do. That said, it was one of the best third-person character action games that has ever been made in the history of the damn planet. So, being just a moderate success is really not enough, and it seemed that the publisher Sega did not want to pay for a sequel. So along comes Nintendo and says, well, if you make it for the Wii U, we will pay for the sequel, which has allowed for Bayonetta 2 to be created, and has also allowed a remastered version of the original Bayonetta to be released with the same game, and that's coming out towards the end of the year. So it's certainly a win at least if you look at it from that perspective for those that like the Bayonetta franchise. The argument is that Bayonetta 2 would never exist if it wasn't a Nintendo exclusive in the first place. And you could apply that to various titles. Now, you could also make a fairly strong argument that console exclusive games are generally among the best that the machine has to offer. Now, this is not usually the case when the console first comes out. A lot of the original exclusives are really not that good because, frankly, they're on a timer. They've got to be released with the console itself as part of that launch window, and most games that are released within the launch window are of poorer quality than stuff you get later on. You can look back through history and you'll find plenty of examples of games that really didn't cut the mustard when it came to exclusive titles. I remember buying Perfect Dark Zero. What a bloody mistake that was. And even recently, with games like Dead Rising 3 not running particularly well, and of course Crimson Dragon being a horribly monetized waste of time for the most part, these games are not really comparable to the stuff that ends up coming along later on. And usually a lot of those games are swan songs for the system. The Last of Us is a good example. You can look at things like Xenoblade for the Wii, even further back to Panzer Dragoon Saga for the Sega Saturn. This kind of thing happens quite a bit. And there's a number of reasons for it. One, there's a lot more financial stability available because these games are being directly supported by the console manufacturers. And once the launch window is gone, you usually have a decent amount of time to work on this sort of stuff. There is a reason why The Last of Us ended up being as good as it was. Would it have been better if it was released as a multi-platform title? It's possible, but those that are in support of the exclusive business model would argue that the only reason it's as good as it is is because of the huge amount of cash that Sony threw at it and the development support that they provided. There are a few other reasons why these titles often end up being technically superior to some multi-platform releases. The fact of the matter is, it's easier to develop for one system than it is to develop for multiple systems. It allows you to focus on the intricacies and eccentricities of one specific platform and optimize it for that platform alone. Whereas if you're releasing a multi-format release, then you have to spend more money and more resources and more time developing for multiple platforms as opposed to investing all of that development time into one platform. There is a reason why most exclusive games look better than most multi-format games on the same system. And of course, there's a reason why PC exclusive titles like Star Citizen, or of course, formerly Crisis, look better than everything. If you focus on one system, then you don't have to compromise for the others. But simultaneously, that becomes the downfall of exclusives. Because especially when you're releasing on a platform like the Xbox, which is not as fast as the PlayStation 4 and is four plus years behind the current gaming PC, then you're going to have a more limited experience and you have to compromise for the platform you're developing exclusively for. As good as The Last of Us was, was, it was also simultaneously a game that was pushing the PlayStation 3 to its absolute limit and couldn't even maintain 30 FPS, which made it a very unpleasant gaming experience for those of us used to 60 FPS. The Xbox One is currently struggling when it comes to keeping up with the frame rate and resolution of the PlayStation 4 because it is objectively a less powerful system. That means, of course, that those of us that want the best gaming experience will not be able to get it because that game is on Xbox One why a lot of us were very happy that Dead Rising 3 is coming to PC, because we couldn't really enjoy it on Xbox One. I certainly couldn't. That game tanked like 25, 20 FPS at times, and the controls were clunky. It just wasn't a very good experience. And this comes from somebody, by the way, that has played all the other Dead Rising games, including the original, on the original Xbox 360, and dealt with its problems there, because the game was simply that good. Now, we know that this is not going to be an actual exclusive. It's merely a timed exclusive, and frankly, I can wait. As a PC gamer, I'm used to it, and 
I don't really have too much of a problem with it. I don't feel the need to dive into these games on day one outside of my own professional need to do so as somebody that does first impressions of video games. But I am very, very happy to wait. There are plenty of other games to play, and in fact there are so many games coming out there's no way that we could ever play them all. So... Is waiting a problem? No. In fact, waiting is actually a very smart thing to do as a consumer these days, especially on PC. One, if there are problems with the game, they need to either be patched or modded out, which takes a little bit of time. Secondly, if you wait, the chances are you're going to save a great deal of money because of how common Steam, GOG, Gamersgate, Green Man Gaming, and all these other digital platform sales actually are. You can save money on games that haven't even been out for all that long if you just have a little bit of patience, which a lot of people do, although a disturbing number clearly do not. However, the fact of the matter is that Tomb Raider was released on Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC at around the same time. And as a direct result, those of us that bought on PC, or indeed bought on PlayStation platform, had a reasonable expectation that the sequel to the game that they supported would also be released on their platform. As it stands, even with timed exclusive, they have to wait. Why? Because a company entirely outside of their control decided to throw money at Square Enix to make them wait. And here's the thing about timed exclusives. No consumer ever wins when it comes to exclusives of any description. It just does not happen. If a game is exclusive to your system, what have you gained over it being a multi-platform title? Bragging rights. That really is all there is to it. And those consumers in support of exclusives are doing so for purely selfish reasons. They get upset when exclusives end up on platforms they don't own, and they gloat when they find exclusives on the platforms they do own. Which is a ridiculous piece of cognitive dissonance when you think about it, and it involves these people convincing themselves that the games they can't play are actually worse than the games they can play. It requires some very serious mental gymnastics, Olympic level, as far as I'm concerned. Outside of the business reasons that I gave earlier, which do apply to some games, although certainly not to all, it's my belief that the only titles that should ever be exclusives are first-party developed releases. We understand that these companies have to be competitive with each other, and the way that they've traditionally done that is either to try and overpower their competitor by creating a better system with better services and more power behind it, and or develop exclusive releases which get people to buy the console. But they do that in-house, yeah? They do that with studios they own. They don't take a sequel to something that was multi-platform and say, eh, eh, can't have it anymore. That's actually a fairly rare thing. And there's a huge difference between what they're doing with Bayonetta 2 and what they're doing with Rise of the Tomb Raider. Again, I need to emphasize that timed exclusive is not a big deal, as long as we know it's coming to our platforms that I personally don't really care. But if you look at the difference between the two, Bayonetta 2 is only being developed because Nintendo gave them the money to do so. It was not going to happen without it, and the original Bayonetta did not sell very well. Square Enix is a huge huge publisher, and Tomb Raider sold over 6 million copies. Now, if that is not enough to make Tomb Raider profitable, then I think that Square Enix needs to take a very, very long, hard look at their development cycle. If it really costs them that much to make that game, and if it really requires that many sales to actually break even, that is ludicrous. Like, how can you sell 6 million copies and not be a success? This kind of wheeling and dealing is not good for the consumer under any circumstances. Amusingly, what's probably going to end up happening here, especially for those that decided to gloat over this that happened to own an Xbox One, is they're going to receive the poorest version of the game. The additional development time after the fact into the PS4 and PC versions will most likely result in a superior product, and of course it being on PC automatically results in a superior product if the port is reasonable, simply because there is more power available there. What's also likely is that these versions will include at least a piece of DLC or some kind of improvement. Are we really that obsessed with buying games on day one these days? How many times do you have to be burned by that? How many times do we have to see releases come out in a poor state that need to be patched later on? Why you'd want to own a game on day one and have to slog through that stuff, I really do not know, but some people really do desire to be the first on board, and I can understand that desire even if it's a little bit foolish at times because you simply cannot trust these companies to release these titles in a good state. 
I'm pretty disappointed in both Crystal Dynamics and in Microsoft simply because they felt the need to mislead people and it was only due to a huge amount of outcry and questioning that eventually we found out this would merely be a timed exclusive. You don't go on stage and say this is coming exclusively on Xbox One when that's in fact a lie, but we've seen plenty of that already from both Microsoft and from Sony claiming, oh yeah, it's an exclusive when really what they mean by that is it's not going to be on the other guy's machine, but you can probably find it on PC and maybe a handheld and there might be a mobile spin-off, who knows? Uh, this, this stuff has been going on a lot over the last couple of years, really, and it's very prevalent at these press conferences. And frankly, who the hell was applauding it? i got to ask, I watched this conference, and after the announcement was made, there was a little bit of silence, and then there was applause and whooping. It's like, who was applauding this? If there was a single journalist in that room that was applauding that, leave the industry immediately. Journalists are supposed to be advocates for the consumer in this industry, and more often than not, you find them doing the exact opposite and snuggling up to whatever nonsense it is that a publisher or console creator is trying to pull off next. In the case of previously multi-platform releases that were already technologically impressive, I do not see any benefit whatsoever. There are, as I said, a couple of circumstances where a game can benefit from being an exclusive, but this is not one of those times. This is indicative of a tit-for-tat console war between two underpowered systems, although one is even more underpowered than the other. After just abandoning all the things that made it different, the Xbox One is essentially a less powerful version of the PlayStation 4, which is a less powerful version of a four-year-old PC with a GTX 480 in it. It seems right now that both companies, rather than trying to offer exceptional value for money and customer service, as well as a good selection of first-party developed exclusive titles, have resorted to misinformation and limiting consumer choice to gamers overall. And who loses out? Everybody loses out. There are no winners here. And before you say, well, you know, you don't want PC games to come to console. I actually do. I really do. I would be absolutely happy for that to happen. I am not concerned about things like DayZ going to PlayStation 4 or Space Engineers or Goat Simulator or whatever. That is not important. By all means, have the games. Why shouldn't you experience those? Can we please remember that amongst all the console warring and PC master race joking that goes on, we are still all consumers at the behest of these companies. Consumer conflict and infighting is good for these developers and publishers. It lets them get away with more. It weakens overall consumer strength. It's not the kind of thing that you really should be doing if you don't want to get ripped off. Give them an inch and they will take a mile. They've showed that time and time and time again, and there's no reason to believe that that's going to change any time in the future. First party developed exclusives are an annoying but necessary part of the console war. They have resulted in really great games coming out, but games that would of course be no less great if they happen to also be on PC, in fact they would be a hell of a lot better. Previously exclusive PC games going to PlayStation 4 or Xbox One does not harm PC gamers in any way, shape, or form, and selling to more users means that those companies that you love will end up hopefully getting more money to develop future games. Selling to as wide an audience as possible when the industry is under assault by a veritable army of money-sponging cow clickers coming from the mobile domain to the West is a sensible thing to do and is pro-consumer. Exclusives are not. They never have have been, they never will be, they're a sad reality that we have to live with, but we certainly do not have to tolerate it when previously third-party developers decide to take an exclusive even timed to a different platform because somebody waved some money in front of their face. Nobody wins, and if you're cheering about this timed exclusive, just remember that that cheering will only last as long as it takes for the company whose machine you don't own to pull the same crap on you, at which point you will also be annoyed. Absolutely none of you win. All right, folks, that's been done for the day. Thank you very much for watching the content patch. But before I go, I'd like to give you yet another great OC Remix track from ocremix.org. Fairly appropriate for today's episode, of course, would be one of the greatest exclusive franchises of all time, developed in-house by the one and only Nintendo, that being The Legend of Zelda. There's been a hell of a lot of Zelda remixes over the last decade or so. They will continue to happen, of course, because many of the themes from those games are iconic. This is less of a remix and more of a piano interpretation of Zelda's theme from the Ocarina of Time, originally composed by Koji Kondo and remixed by Nostalvania. You can download this for free in the description below this video. If you enjoyed today's show, then please do click the like button below this video. It is very much appreciated, and I will see you next time.